So what are the results? Every, everybody's all right? And uh, I think we have about 20 minutes more, maybe. Um, <clears throat> results are, I think, quite good. Uh, this is a table that I pulled from the literature. Um, early on, you can see you know, three to five year results uh, were very good, you know, you know, very, very small failure rates. As we get uh, later, towards 10 years now, we're starting to get that data. It's probably about a 5% failure rate at 10 years, meaning 5% of people need uh, revisions. Um, if you break it down to males, and we're going to be spending some time on that, the percentages are better. So um, when Ronan Tracy looked at his results in men only, they had 98% survival at 10 years. And if you look at the whole group, it was 95. So that the, di the discrepancy is women. Uh, if you look at national registries, Australia also has a very good registry. They keep track of their, pay nobody leaves Australia, I guess. So um, <clears throat> they keep track of their revisions. And unfortunately, we are seeing discrepant uh, curves with men and women. So men, excuse me, men here are lower because they have a lower rate of revision at 10 years. And women have a higher rate. And some of this is, um, Important to realize this is in the context of what's gone on in the last few years. So if a newspaper says that you're going to have problems, and a lot of people believe they do have problems, and a lot of surgeons will rush to revise it. So I think the newspaper articles and the negative media definitely increase the revision rate <coughs> also. Um, if you look at uh, total hip, so this is a total hip replacement. This is a chart of the survival or the revision rate in total hip replacement. At 10 years, if you look at, um, so these are, blue is men, females are women. Um, <clears throat> total hips uh, do quite well, but even total hips have revisions. So, you know, up to 8% of men under the age of 65 will have a revision at 10 years. And, and I'll concentrate on this number, seven years here. So about five, 4.9 and 4.6%. This is total hip. So th oh, this is a total hip. Um, so then if we go to resurfacing, which is the next slide, uh, they have seven-year data. So actually for men under the age of 65, I would say that um, it's now becoming clear that resurfacing actually does better than a hip replacement, although the lower rate of revision at seven years. Unfortunately for women, that's not true, which is why you know, we have to consider this operation carefully. Putting it into a graph, um, seven years after surgery, higher bars indicate more revisions. Um, different colors are different ages. Uh, orange is less than 55 resurfacing and less than 55 total hips, so the revision rate for resurfacing is lower. This is for men. And then same thing for the uh, less than 65. So again, it's just a different way to show it. The revision rate is lower for resurfacing now. <clears throat> And a lot of, thing ha a lot of uh, studies have now looked at size, because women do have smaller bones. And that is a, a big reason for that to happen. When the sizes are smaller, the implant is smaller. And the tolerances um, are not as uh, forgiving, I would say, for the smaller sizes. So if you look at 50 millimeter head, which is a big head, um, <clears throat> if you compare women who only have over 50 millimeter heads, their results are exactly the same as men. So it's, it's a size issue. Unfortunately, not many women have 50 millimeter heads because that's, that's a very big size. So um, I would say this is interesting data, but I think you can still achieve the same results with smaller sizes as long as they're, they're put in very precisely. So uh, gender difference, uh, size of bone and therefore implant is clearly a risk factor. Dysplasia is also a risk factor. As I said before, more women have dysplasia and in m multiple studies show dysplasia is a risk factor for revision. Again, because of the angles and edge loading and more females have dysplasia than men. <clears throat> uh, my experience with research, I think I've been really, really lucky to do this and uh, I caught the timing just right so that I started early. I started in 2004, uh, went, got special training with Dr. Amstutz and went other places. I went to visit Kuhn Desmet and Derek and uh, really, you know, I realized they had the most experience. I wanted to travel to the best and get their techniques. I went to Tom Gross as well. So it, it took a lot of time and I did the first resurfacing um, in 2004 
with the Conserve Plus, and then I for the first BHR in New York in May of 2006, and I've performed over, this is out of date now, it's closer to 3,000 now. Um, but uh, I was saying I was fortunate that I did enough before all the negative press hit that I saw really excellent results, saw amazing results from patients, and it, it gave me the courage and uh, the confidence to keep doing, that I was doing the right thing for these patients, uh, that I still do a lot. So, you know, if a surgeon started right in 2006 or 7 and the, all the negative stuff hit, you know, they probably are not going to feel as strongly about it and not want to deal with it, unfortunately. Uh, I have had revisions. We're all going to have revisions. I've had 21 revisions at various times. Uh, three for, for fractures, so three out of a thousand is, is pretty good. Um, osteonecrosis or collapse of the femoral head is, is a possibility and unfortunately the blood supply does get uh, affected when we dislocate the hip and ream a hole down the, the middle of it. So that can, uh, can be an issue. Um, cup loosening can be an issue and sometimes that's related to the implant I think and sometimes it's related to activity that's done too early. Uh, six metal sensitivity, so that's an that's an allergy to the metals, and unfortunately they're all they've all been women, so that's um, <clears throat> something that we're, we've yet to talk about. And for metal reactivity, that's the situation where too much metal is produced, and they just you have inflammation because you're dealing with basically um, <clears throat> an irritating level of metal in your hip, um, and uh, that can be corrected and does have good results after revision. Um, I have had two dislocations. It can pop out, but uh, again, it's much lower than a total hip replacement. So overall, I think uh, the survival curve looks pretty good. So I'm coming out to about um, seven and eight years now. And uh, overall, if you look at the whole group, um, <clears throat> we have a pretty good survival curve with that. So discussion. Um, Lots to talk about. So the risks of resurfacing compared to a hip replacement. First of all, you have femoral neck fracture. So you can't, you can't fracture your femoral neck in a total hip because it's been removed. Um, in, a femoral, in a femoral hip resurfacing, you can break it because it's there. Um, I think a lot of it is technique dependent. If you damage the bone during the surgery, you're going to be weaker. It's going to be more prone to fracture. I think we have better instruments today to avoid that. And if you look at the Australian registry, the, that large uh, national registry, they quote about a one and a half percent incidence, but I think you can bring it way down and, and knock on wood, I've been fortunate enough to only have a few. Um, osteonecrosis, that is a concern. So this is just a, an interesting preparation of a head where you see the blood supply to the hip. And this is uh, the area that can die after you prepare it and dislocate it. So you have to know where the blood vessels are and I'm intimately involved in research to understand that. I preserve this with uh, soft tissue preparation that um, many, most of the, the uh, uh, surgeons who do hip resurfacing in a large volume do. So um, it just requires patience and a little bit of a different approach than their total hip replacement to preserve all of this blood supply. And uh, I did want to mention, some believe that there must be a certain amount of arthritis before hip resurfacing can be performed. So if you do your hip resurfacing too early before the blood supply inside develops, then VJ Bose, for example, believes you're more subject to that happening. So he, he sometimes makes people wait a little bit in order to develop that blood supply, and I think that's um, an interesting concept. <clears throat> Uh, there's definitely going to be metal ion dispersal. So no matter how frictionless and smooth you feel the surfaces and they spin around, you will de generate debris. And cobalt and chromium will be produced and they'll circulate through your body. They're taken up by your bloodstream. Your kidneys will filter out the majority of it, but there's always a dilute level in the bloodstream. And um, what we're usually seeing is in the parts per billion, single digit parts per billion, uh, it's very controversial about measuring these. I like to measure it because it gives me more information um, and I think it will be valuable in the future and it's good to have a baseline. But some surgeons, in, and including our FDA, have not embraced metal ion uh, measurements. There is a lot of variability, so you have to go to a reputable lab. It has to be done properly. They have to spin the blood right away. So not every lab can do it. Um, and the results can vary from time to time. So, you know, it's not certain how to interpret it but I think it gives information. Um, there have been some reports that if your levels go really high, it can affect your whole body. And people what have talked really to you about, um, it would be like over 100, 100 parts per billion. 
So uh, that's, that's in the literature where people have talked about hypothyroidism, uh, effects on the heart, and, and uh, even your hearing. So people have had hearing loss, apparently, when their cobalt levels get high. <clears throat> so that's why I like to keep track of it. Um, <clears throat> inside the body, also, uh, there's theoretical concerns for cancer. People are always worried about cancer and will this hip cause cancer. And this, I can pretty confidently tell you the answer is no. And that's, that's good news. And um, <clears throat> another registry in Finland compared uh, metal hips that were done in the 70s. And they looked at those for over 30 years, about 28 years. And they, they cross-referenced it to their cancer registry. So again, they were able to identify patients who had metal and metal hips. They looked at their cancer registry. And they found no increased incidence of cancer. And in fact, it was lower than the general population, which may just be a statistical thing, or maybe that patients are uh, living healthier, more active, and doing things to preserve their health. So I'm pretty confident and it's not going to cause cancer, but there are issues and uh, we, I think, need to monitor that. <clears throat> um, it is recommended that we r avoid the metal metal bearing in women of childbearing and lactating age. Um, certainly, you've, you've probably heard of people having babies with resurfacing and, and they're healthy and, and that's all well and good. I think uh, it's uncertain what, what the effects are. So it's I think maybe a relative contradiction, but um, we really don't know the effect on a developing fetus. So if it can be avoided, I think that's better. Um, and people with impaired kidney function, I think, as we talked about before. Metal allergy, that is a big concern. And that is really something we just don't understand enough about. This is a paper written in 2004. So 2004 was the first report of metal allergy with total hip replacement. And they've called it ALVAL, which is the acronym for aseptic lymphocytic vasculitis associated lesion. It's a fancy way to say aseptic, it's not an infection. Lymphocytic, it involves these kinds of immune cells or lymphocytes. Vasculitis, there's inflammation around the blood vessels, and uh, it's, so it's, it's a lesion associated with these blood vessels and things like that. And unfortunately, um, this does seem to happen in a subset of patients, and we don't have any tests for this right now. Um, you know, Derek is experimenting with something called the lymphocyte transformation test. Uh, we do have a center in Chicago that does it. Some of you have had it. Um, I would say there's no clinical correlation at this point. So I've done people who have tested high on the allergy scale and they still wanted their resurfacing and they did fine even though they had a high allergy test. And I've had people who have definitely had an allergic reaction and they do the test and it's negative. So I really haven't uh, found it to be that helpful. Questions? What's yeah. the overall incidence of allergic reaction? Right, uh, really good question that I think is hard if not impossible to answer. So uh, not that many pathologists are able to diagnose it. So a lot of you may be familiar with Pat Campbell. Pat Campbell is uh, the pathologist on that paper who who've discovered it and basically is the person who coined the term. And uh, she obviously knows what she's doing, but the usual pathologist in a community hospital may not know. Um, our pathologist got training from Pat Campbell so that he, he can diagnose that. So uh, first of all, I'm not sure uh, it's being properly uh, read. And then also, there's no registry that keeps all of those in a central database. Following on, yeah. what does a, you know, the AL, BAL, in layperson's terms, what does that mean for, for, for someone? What, um, that, that, it means, that, that, yeah. Thing? So great question. The question, if uh, I'll repeat it for the the microphone is that uh, how does it manifest itself? What can people, what do people feel with this kind of alval reaction? And um, they generally feel pain. They feel discomfort. Um, sometimes they feel swelling. Uh, so they, they may actually have swelling, and we'll go through that later. And they have what's called a pseudo tumor. Um, sometimes they just feel pain constantly, like a toothache. Um, it can be. It's very, very kind of vague. Um, and it's, it's hard to um, put a finger on. Sometimes after surgery it seems like, well, that's just the muscle and it's hard to diagnose. So you, we really can't diagnose that unless we get tissue from the hip. And the percentage, um, we don't know, but it's definitely higher in women than men. Um, <clears throat> 
as I said, no, no proven tests. Some people have had skin testing. There's no, that's, there's no correlation between what happens by putting a metal piece on your skin and what's happening in your body. It's totally different. There's different elements inside. It's different particle sizes. So again, haven't really found. And, and people get this with a total hip. There's certainly a lot of metal there as well. Yes. Not so, surface, um, but. well, uh, so the question is, uh, can that allergic response happen with a total hip? And the answer is definitely. And in fact, uh, it may be higher because in a total hip uh, that's metal on metal, first of all, um, there are more interfaces, more, more junctions that can create corrosion. So the hip resurfacing is only two pieces. Most metal on metal hips are at least four pieces. And those uh, combinations of metals may cause more cor corrosion that can lead to that problem. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, we've certainly evolved in our understanding and that's going to help us get better results. You know, back when we first started, we thought we should put it like a total hip and leave it at that. But now we've really understand, better understanding of implant position. And uh, I've, I've had the good fortune of working with Kuhn on some papers uh, where we looked at uh, the results and if the cup is really high and it's over 55, that's considered steep and it's strongly correlated with higher metal levels. It's not a guarantee though that you're gonna have higher metal levels. Some people can have a cup that's higher than this and if their metal levels are fine, then for that person it seems to be working okay. Um, but if you have a lot of metals, it can lead to local tissue irritation, swelling, and pain. Uh, in this paper, we looked at 42 revisions of resurfacings and the malpositioning of the component, the cup side was the most common reason and it was too vertical. <clears throat> This is an example of a patient who had their hip done elsewhere. Um, it's hard for you guys to see perhaps, but uh, their cup angle was about 60 degrees here. And they did have pain a few years after surgery. And when we measured their metal levels, uh, they were over 100. So these are very high. And then two months post-op after I fixed their hip to a hip replacement, they come down dramatically. And they continue to come down for um, over a year. And they get to almost the normal position. And once they're normalized, the, the symptoms are gone. So, um, is yes. Is it ever possible just to reposition that cup? Yeah, so the question is, can you just reposition that cup? Uh, the answer is yes. It depends on many factors, including implant size, uh, bone quality, bone anatomy, and probably the length of time that this has gone on. Presumably, if this has gone on, let's say, for two years, their head is going to be worn. And then putting a worn head with a new socket is questionable whether that's going to work well. I have done uh, some revisions of cup only uh, for pati patients with, re with malpositioned cups, and their metal levels have come down. So it can be done, but um, <clears throat> it can be difficult because we can't put screws in for the resurfacing in general. And sometimes in a revision, you need some extra stability on the cup. And this is what the hip would look like in, in surgery. You know, all this gray stuff is metal debris. And the, it, you can see that the hip looks angry. It's really red. It's irritated. That's that aching pain that some people have, unfortunately. Where, uh, but, but this can all be cleaned up. And it's not an allergy. So it's, this wasn't an allergy. And uh, uh, it was just a lot of metal. So their, their results are very good after surgery.